Janet took up stamp collecting in 2005 after a long break brought on by work and children. He decided to build a specialized collection of the USA three cent stamp of 1861. Was lucky to stumble upon Jim Lee's website early on. I collected silently with Jim as a guide until about 2014 when Scott Preppel from Siegel Auctions suggested I should exhibit competitively. He joined the Royal Cape Town, the Royal of Cape Town, and exhibited five frames for the first time in 2015 at the South African National Stamp Show. Result was a large gold and a grand. That's pretty good for a novice. Uh, national shows since then, he showed the exhibit twice in the USA, WSP shows, getting a large gold and a grand both times. West Pex 2017 and Chicago Pex 2019. He also started collecting one framers, a part of me, also started exhibiting one framers in national shows 2019 to 2022, entered two exhibits for SAVPEX Virtual in 2019, Liberty Head Essays, Lowenberg Inventions, got large gold and gold respectively. Entered Grill Essays, One Framer in SAVPEX 2021 and got large gold and the grand. Entered the Lowenbrow Exhibit in CANPEX Virtual Show in April 2021 large gold and one frame reserve grand. Entered grill essays, one framer in Canpex, June 2021, and got a large gold and the one frame grand. Entered a new one frame exhibit about the design process for the US 1861 three cent stamp in Pipex 2022, another large gold. I can go on and on and on and on. Uh, this, this resume is just astounding. I'm going to, if it hasn't been sent to Ken to put it on our website, it will be. Uh, for, without further ado, I give you Jan Hoffmeyer. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Let me um, share my screen. This is the first time that I'm going to be um, speaking to this. And uh, <clears throat> so I have no idea how it's going to go, but, uh, you know, let's just see. If anybody wants to interrupt at any point, um, please feel free to do so. And um, if you, if it's really too boring for words, I don't mind if you shut your video off and have a nap. Um, so I don't know why. I, oh, there we go. I want to get this stuff out of the way here. I've changed the title because it more accurately reflects what I'm doing. It's the process that led to the growth stamps of the United States because it was a process. So more than the evolution of the growth and, and, and the development of, of the growth stamps, it was a process because it involved political elements, legal elements, and not just technical elements. Um, this is a kind of a rogues gallery here of, uh, of growth stamps. Uh, and, and they are among the most uh, ex expensive stamps in the world. Three of them are of the Z grill, the one cent, the 10 cent, and the 15 cent. And then there's the B grill, uh, the three cent B grill. And those are the, 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 the current um, Scott uh, prices for these stamps. I can imagine when I thought about collecting, um, I saw these sorts of numbers and concluded that there was no way that I could get into the, this area, but kind of drifted in by mistake. Fortunately, I found a way to exhibit without having to buy these stamps. What makes the difference between these stamps and the normal 1861 issue is hopefully you can see it there, the grill. It's indentations on the stamp that were referred to. <coughs> Sorry, can you just put him in the bedroom? Sorry, guys. <laughs> I think that was a bird. So um, indentations on the stamp that were, that, that were called by the inventor, uh, Charles Steele, embossed. He never called his stamps a grill. But the word grill comes from the French word grille because uh, that's what it looks like. And the difference that those markings make in the case of the 10 cent 
Um, the one on the left would cost you about $375. The one on the right would cost you about $750,000. So how did all of this uh, begin? I think we should contextualize it by, by recognizing some of the knowledge and history that has gone into this whole area. And you can't really talk about it without talking about Clarence Fraser. It's surprisingly difficult given his importance to, um, to pre-production material in the United States, surprisingly difficult to find good photographs of him, but this is the best I could find. Um, and that's a reprint of his classic um, uh, a book, which was published in 1941 or 44, I think the first time republished in 77 with three addenda from the Essay Proof Journal. Now, um, the Travers Papers, uh, I think, are fairly well known. What happened in the case of the Travers Papers, a, a whole lot of archival documentation was being thrown out. Uh, and before they got thrown out, Travers made copies of everything that related to actual stamps issued. What he didn't do was copy any correspondence that related to the process of getting to the issuing of the stamps. The Brazer archive derives from Clarence Brazer going back into the archives and recording all the correspondence that had to do with the essay material, the contracts um, between the United States Post Office and, and the printers. And that filled in the gap uh, that Travis hadn't filled in. He copied these things out laboriously by hand. And because he was doing that, he only copied every second letter. So when you look at the Brazer archive, you see the second letter, you have to suppose what was in the first letter. Typed up by a secretary in triplicate, Brazer died in 1956 and the archive disappeared. It was rediscovered by Jim Lee almost 40 years later when Falk Finkelberg died. And Jim was asked by uh, the estate of Finkelberg to go and evaluate um, uh, Finkelberg's uh, um, philatelic material. And there in the box was the Brazer archive. Jim never had a chance to do anything with it. Um, I became very good friends with him. Uh, and so he, 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 he gave me the standing in, uh, invitation to visit his home in Chicago um, and look at the material. Um, and I finally got to spend some days at his house in 2017, uh, copied all the stuff that I needed. And it, 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 it led to three articles in the Chronicle, one on Lohenberg, two on Steele. And this presentation and the one frame exhibit really come from that. It comes from what I learned uh, by reading uh, by reading the letters in the archive. Now, process in this context has two meanings. The first meaning is a technical meaning, um, and it's about the experimentation that went into the, what ultimately became uh, the officially issued Grill stamps. But it's also about the process uh, that led to that, the trials and tribulations of Charles Steele, uh, because you know he began this in, in 1865, but the first official stamps were only issue, uh, distributed in 1868. So there's this three year process that he went through um, before uh, the, his idea was accepted and, and is still the only patented idea accepted um, for the prevention of reuse uh, of American stamps it was used between 68 and 73. So process here has two dimensions and the neat thing about the archive is that it illustrates both dimensions both the technical uh, and, 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 and the political. Uh, the archive is currently being um, scanned and put onto the, web, on, onto the web by the United States Philatelic Classic Society uh, and, and the references there. So let's have a look at, um, at, at where this all begins. It begins with a concern about the prevention of reuse uh, and I think what one might call the era of patents for the prevention of reuse. And um, I mean, most of the effort went into how do you frank a stamp or cancel a stamp so that it can't be reused. Um, but they turned out to be quite easy to clean. And so in about 1860, you get the, the era of the patents to develop stamps that were impossible to clean and reuse because in some way they'd be damaged or, or be self canceling um, the place to start, I think, is with the 1860 patent. Morrison was the inventor. Leeds bought the invention. Franklin became his partner. It's a neat idea that involves um, 
holes in the envelope so that you can do stuff to the underlying documents. And Morrison's original idea was that you could make it possible to cancel on the document to prove when a legal document had been sent, because it was often a matter of dispute, post being relatively slow, people had to sign something by a certain date to prove that it had been signed by that date. Morrison came up with this idea. Leeds bought the patent from Morrison and then realized that there might be an opportunity to turn it into a self-canceling stamp concept. Um, and so what happens is you put the stamp over this little grid uh, and the idea was you pull, you pull the envelope out, you destroy the, uh, the, the letter out, you destroy this, the stamp in the process. Um, and that's 1860. Fast forward to 1863, and we get the first um, Lowenberg decal. It's stuck to the back of a letter that uh, James McDonough wrote to Alexander Zeveli of the United States Post Office as an idea for a stamp that would be impossible to take off an envelope, clean and reuse, because in taking it off, you would take the paper off and leave the stamp design behind. This uh, it, it is, as far as we know, the first Lohenberg uh, decal. So this is 1860, 1863, and 1864. There were three patents that led to experiments by the National Bank Boat Company. Um, there's the Gibson patent, which is a stamp with a network overprint. The network overprint is supposed to be in fugitive ink. I think you can just make it out over here. Uh, and so any attempt to clean a cancel off the stamp would take fugitive, fugitive ink off. There's the Harmon patent also from uh, this year. I have a theory that this might have been a private, uh, privately produced uh, stamp uh, essay rather than, than the NBNC. It looks as if two might have gone through the post because they canceled uh, by Buffalo um, cancellations. But again, the, the, the idea is an overprint uh, that would then wash off if you try to clean the cancel off. And the difference between Gibson and Harmon was that uh, Harmon suggested that canceling ink be used. So anything that would clean a cancel off would, aut would auto automatically clean uh, the uh, uh, network off. And then there's Lohenberg's um, a, a patent for printing on, on, on coated paper, in this case, starch. This brings us to 1865 and two letters that are in the archive from Zeveli to Charles Steele. Now Zeveli is responding to Steele, but you can tell from Zeveli's response what was in Steele's uh, uh, letters. I'm going to read Zeveli's letters and then summarize what's in them. And, and we'll take the story forward from there. So on December the 13th, Zeveli wrote to Steele, he says this, this department wants, a postage stamp from which it will be impossible to remove cancelling marks without destroying the stamp. If you can establish your claim to such an invention, it might be introduced through the National Banknote Company. Basically, Zevely is saying you have to introduce it through the NBNC because they have the contract. As to compensation, what you might get paid, this would have to go to Congress and they'd have to agree. But before that, we'd have to prove uh, that uh, it couldn't be uh, uh, reused. So Steele took this as quite encouraging and sent Zeveli um, some samples. And on the 20th of December, Zeveli wrote again, he says, acknowledging, so the first letter says, you know, what if I came up with something? Um, Zeveli says, yes, we want such a stamp. You have to work through the NBNC and payment would require Congress approval. So uh, Steele sends Zevely some samples and Zevely says, acknowledging the receipt of the samples with which I'm favorably impressed, but I can't do anything unless you prove that they work. My suggestion is to, to you is that you actually take some existing stamps from 1861, um, treat them in the way that you've suggested and send them through the post in the normal way and we'll see whether it works. In other words, a live experiment of the idea. So here are samples of my idea, says um, Steele. Zeveli says, I'm impressed. You have to work through the NBNC. The best test would be a live test. What might have been the nature of the samples that were sent? Um, this is an essay from um, 
produced by Charles Steele. Charles Steele, by the way, was the operations manager for the National Banknote Company, what we would call nowadays the operations manager. Here, um, Steele is claiming ownership. It's the first experiment. You can see um, uh, the grill in the middle of this <laughs> scruffy piece of paper. There are only two of these. Um, Seagulls on some of their, uh, in some of their auctions says three, but they haven't been able to show me the third yet. So I think they're probably only two. So this is what we're talking about. Um, but Steele made no headway. You know, so where we are is everybody says, this might be a good idea. Why don't you try it? You're in the NBNC, you're the operations manager, just produce some stamps, send them out, let them go through the post and see what happens. Um, he makes no headway in 1866, but the National Banknote Company continued to conduct experiments with patents, not with Steele's patent, but with other patents. And in particular, they conducted experiments that produced these essays. Now, these essays are by James McDonough, who was the secretary of the NBNC. Um, it's, I love them, but they're really scrappy, and you can see why they were never adopted. It's an idea for a fugitive ink based on glycerine. And glycerine would make it very runny, um, almost impossible to clean a cancel off without cleaning the glycerine off. And the way that you can see them is, first of all, you can see that the ink actually continued to run after printing. You can see that especially on the left-hand side. Um, and secondly, um, under light, they glisten. You can see the glycerine. The NBNC spent the next three years trying to persuade, you can see this in the archive, persuade Zevely to use McDonough's fugitive ink rather than Steele's uh, patent. The other one that they experimented with was Wyckoff's um, coated paper, much better than starch coated paper. These are essays from, from uh, Wickhoff's coated paper, which use zinc oxide, print on the coating, um, and it washes off really easily. And that was the discovery copy where the person who discovered it actually took some of the thing away. So nothing happens until the end of the year, Steele writes for Zeverly. And this is what um, Steele says. I enclose several specimens of my stamp in a finished condition. Now remember, Steele uh, was in control of the engine room, the factory. So he was able to use NBNC's machinery to produce these things. I claim for them that they are superior to the present stamp. That is the present 1861 issue. It's quite important to read this letter because it's part of the motivation and part of the way in which Steele persuaded Zevely to take his ideas seriously. The present stamp is printed on the whole surface under very great pressure and consequently presents a hard, compressed, oily face, which resists the penetrating action of cancelling ink and allows the ink to dry on the surface. And that is why they are so easy to clean and reuse. My stamp has a large space in the center of plain unprinted paper weakened and broken by embossing, which immediately absorbs any ink or fluid which may touch it. And these marks cannot be removed without destroying the stamp. I think it could even be difficult to remove lead pencil marks from them. It then goes on to say something else really important in the development of our understanding of how this whole thing developed. He says, I'm currently working on a second patent application now, he'd obviously been doing some experiments up to now. Um, and I really would appreciate your support in getting this application accepted. So what's in the letter? Let's summarize very quickly. That's a picture of the grill that he, that he was working with at this time. It's a flat square grill. Normal stamps don't absorb canceling ink. My stamps, uh, I've got given you some copies of my stamps in finished condition. Um, you'll notice that there's a large unprinted embossed center, um, which may even absorb lead pencil if they're going to be impossible to clean. And I'm working on a second version of the patent now, and I'd like your support. We can't be exactly sure what, what was in the envelope that um, Steele sent, but it was probably these essays, which don't have a design on them, but are finished stamps with an embossed center 
and they have this flat square grill, which was the shape of the very first experiments. So at this stage, Steele is still working with the square grill, flat square grill, but he's already moved to the notion that it's only going to work if part of the stamp isn't printed on, because the broken paper needs to be, if you like, untampered with in order for it to absorb cancelling ink. And here's his suggestion for what a stamp might look like. Now um, is a good time to pause. We're at the end of 1866 already. A year has gone by since the first letter. We close to, um, we're early 1867, and we get two shapes of grill. The early one, which is the square uh, flat bottom, and a new one, which is this pyramid shape, uh, indented pyramids. Um, and I'm going to show you what we've got here are two, um, two experiments with uh, cancellation to see to what extent the flat square grill would work. Um, and in fact, if you look at the New York segmented one at the bottom, you can see how clean that cancellation is. It becomes clear that Steele was really worried that his idea wouldn't work at all. So um, he begins work on a second uh, draft of the patent. And there's a range of different things that, that concern him. First of all, he was worried that uh, normal printing wouldn't print very well onto an embossed surface. So his idea would, was that um, you should emboss first and then you should flatten the embossing and then print on it. But he was worried that flattening the embossing would make it even more less likely that, that cancelling ink would uh, sink into the surface. And this is why he came up with the idea of a stamp that has a center that's not printed on. So from very early on, you, you can see that he's struggling with the notion of whether uh, it will work at all. He was also worried that embossing would weaken the paper so much, especially his design, which had an unprinted center, that it would weaken the paper so much that any glue would seep through to the front of the stamp and disfigure the stamp. So part of his whole idea was that you should change the printing process entirely. So the way that it used to work, uh, or was working at the time, is that you would um, damp the paper so that it could uh, receive um, engraved printing, print on damp paper, uh, and only then uh, gum and perforate the stamps. Steele insisted that the paper should be gummed first because he didn't want gum to seep through the weakened embossed paper. But then you have the problem of um, needing to dampen the paper uh, in order to print on it and, and it's already gummed. So then he suggested that um, the United States should switch to surface printed designs, not uh, engraved designs, or have uh, the center ungummed. So, um, one of the um, unintended consequences, if you like, of his idea is that he quickly discovered that it would be almost impossible to implement uh, under uh, given the existing stamps. In any case, um, about this time, he produces the pyramid grill, which he hoped would weaken the paper more than the flat square grill. And this is an early essay um, that comes from uh, 1867, uh, which involves the pyramid grill, um, also involves surface printing on the pyramid grill to prove that surface printing works better, and a pen cancellation. And I've picked up a piece over here of the pen ca cancellation to show uh, that it uh, smudges. So here is where steel is at the beginning of uh, 1867. Zevely by now, this time, was thoroughly persuaded. The NBNC at the same time was trying to get uh, McDonough's ink accepted and um, not really going ahead with uh, Zevely's idea of trying the experiment on, on actual stamps um, until Zevely lost his patience. And on July the 26th, 
he wrote to Shepard, who was the president of the NBNC. So he went to the top. He basically says, I want you to produce these stamps now. Um, I'll read you what he says. Um, After due inspection of the specimen postage stamp submitted, I'm free to say that those embossed in the sheet are more desirable on many accounts than any heretofore presented, any of the other experiments you've done. One thing that we need to prove though, is that they can be sent large distances and so I'm instructing you, basically he says, to print 10,000 sheets using the three cent stamp and to send them out to distant post offices and try them. So this is what sends Everly's letter to the NBNC. The grill idea is best. We need to test portability, produce the 10,000 sheets and send them to distant post offices. This is a um, plate proof imperfect gummed uh, with the biscuit grill. Now this is the pyramid grill and this is the first they cover. I think there are about four of them. Now what I'm gonna do here is show you what the stamp itself looks like by zooming in. So there is the A grill, so-called, all over embossed. You can see that the embossing was very effective in terms of weakening the stamp. But it did so much damage to the stamp that the stamps could not be used without being damaged themselves. Uh, And so we very quickly moved. I'm going to go back to presentation mode. to another letter from Zevli to Shepard, to the boss. And in this letter, he says, I beg to remind you that I'm awaiting anxiously to receive the specimen of postage stamp promised by you, especially those with the embossed center, because the stamps with the entire surface embossed will not meet the needs of the department. So we've got um, the United States Post, Post Office saying to the NBNC, we want the embossed stamps, but it can't be all over uh, embossed. Um, And then on October the 8th, he writes to to Steele and he says, I've just wrote written uh, to the NBNC. I've told them that I want samples of a new grill that only grills the center and your order is about to be issued. Your, Your patent is about to be issued. So we're making progress. This is what the C grill looks like. It's now the pyramid grill inside the stamp. And these eventually became stamps that also got used uh, experimentally. But you'll also see here a neat uh, illustration of the way in which um, they experimented with flattening and different degrees of flattening the grill in order to be able to print the normal stamps, the engraved stamps on the paper uh, in the first place. So on October the 22nd, Steele's patent is finally uh, issued and Steele illustrated his idea with this picture. The elements of his patent are fairly straightforward. There must be lithographic printing, that's his ideal stamp. There must be a large blank embossed center which doesn't have to be flattened so that it can absorb ink And ideally, just to make absolutely sure that these stamps cannot be cleaned and reused, it must be done on chemically sensitive and tinted paper. Um, These uh, particular essays use a kind of a flattened pyramid. Zevely writes to Steele the day after the patent has been issued. uh, And he says to, uh, in his letter, he says, The Postmaster General really likes your idea. We want a surface printed stamp ideally. Why not combine it with McDonough's Fugitive Ink? Now, why I pull that out is because the NBNC was still trying to get um, the post office to use the Fugitive Ink idea of of James McDonough. Um, And the NBNC uh, says, Zevely, um, um, uh, confirm that they are going to they have produced a Seagrill for trials. Um, uh, and they've also told Zevely uh, that they will now ask Steele to come forward with any other ideas. And then Zevely says this in his letter of the 23rd of October, 1867. 
I think your company will finally do you justice. They're seeming very slow about it. So what we've had is two years nearly of an idea that Steel has been in a position to experiment with because he's the, he's the boss of the factory, that the NBNC has been resisting, that Zevely has been pushing. Um, and that's where I put this essay because it's the essay that records the NBNC's final capitulation. It's the only one that we've got where Charles Steele signs himself as the inventor and four officers of the NBNC recognize that he is actually the inventor. In terms of modern corporate uh, contracts, it's quite surprising, it was surprising to me to discover that somebody who is an employee could still claim intellectual property ownership, even though that person had obviously used the factory equipment of their employer to take the idea forward. So on November the 6th, 1867, the NBNC, James McDonough invites um, Steele to a meeting um, in which they talk about taking the contract forward but also the other ideas that he might have. So still, uh, McDonough actually says to Steele, bring your ideas and designs if you have any. And that's, that's where I think these essays come from. This is a, an essay, it's the only one that is signed by, by McDonough, recording that they produced this according to Steele's idea. McDonough writes again to Steele on the 15th to say, we've prepared the die We've actually produced essays according to your design, but the die needs to be deepened around the three because with an unprinted center, people can't see that there's a three. They, can't, you know, they wouldn't be able to see what the, dom dom the domination is. And that's what makes sense of this particular essay. It's the only one there is, and it's, it's an essay which uses Steele's design with the unembossed center with the three colored in. Uh, and then here we've got another die. There are two of these, never sent through the post, but uh, um, cancelled with a, with a Washington cancel and a target cancel to see whether it absorbs cancelling. So you've got two processes going on at the moment. You've got let's experiment on the 1861 design on the 1861 engraved stamps, but also let's have a look at this new set of designs. In addition, they produced a range of tests on surface printed stamps because as Zevely kept on saying, we want surface printed stamps. And this is the seed roll on a bunch of surface printed essays, which must also date to about um, November, uh, 1867. Now, there are also these really intriguing essays. They've always been included in grill sections of the catalog and grill exhibitors have always included them in the grill section of their exhibits. But they don't bear any resemblance to Steele's patent, except that they involve punctured paper. So I have an hypothesis here. These are close-ups of these. The middle one is very well known as the music box grill. You can see the little punctured marks. Um, I call them the scratch pattern essays. And my hypothesis is that the NBNC realized that this was the direction the United States Post Office wanted to go in, but the cost of paying a royalty on top of the cost of producing stamps would be so great that it would be very difficult to put together a contract proposal to win the contract for the 1869 uh, or 70 uh, issue. So they experimented with their own forms of simpler punctured paper. And that's what I think is going on here. That it's attempts by the NBNC to sidestep Steele's patent. Um, that's my hypothesis. There's nothing in the archive to prove that, but it's the only way that these experiments make sense. In any case, um, at the end of 1867, uh, the NBNC approaches Zevely and say, look, you've got to make a decision. As Zevely says, um, go ahead uh, and begin by grilling all of the 
uh, remainders, all of the stocks of 1861 issue that you've got. And then we'll talk about the 1869 issue and the new contract. And the first grill for officially distributed stamps was the Z grill. They were distributed in January of 1868. And um, the Z grill was in issue for a very short period of time. Uh, and that's why, why they're so expensive. So here they are, the three heroes of um, North American philately, the one cent Z grill, the 10 cent Z grill, and the 15 cent uh, Z grill. Um, and that's the story of how uh, we got to that point. And that's it. Um, no more about essays um, and no more about the grills. Thank you. First of all, remember they're not called grills, they're, they're embossed stamps. But you have to use the word grill because that's what people, how people know them. Um, the grills were studied, I think it was Stevenson, there was an early philatelist who tried to organize them in the order that they were produced. So the A grill was the first all over grill that went through the post experimentally. That was the one that didn't work because it damaged the stamps. The C grill, I'll come to the B grill in a moment. The C grill um, was the second one that was experimentally produced, was it produced for experimentation, went through the post. The D, E, and F grills are common. Then you discover the Z grill that comes in between because it was produced for a very short period of time. Um, there are only two um, of the one cent and there are only three of the 15 cent and I think they're four of the 10 cent, that's why they're so expensive. So um, we've already got an A and a C and a D and an E and an F. And so he goes Z and plonks it in the middle as the first one that was actually officially used. That raises a question about the B-Grill. Now the B-Grill, those of you, I, I don't know how much you know about American philately, but there are only four copies of the B-Grill. It's the three cent stamp. It is a grill that looks like it's not quite a C grill. So it's a bit bigger and it's on its side. Uh, so it, it kind of looks like it was halfway between the A and the C, but it was, there are only four copies that were discovered on one letter that was posted in 1869. My hypothesis Good. is that we get to 1869 and the NBNC now has to clear out, uh, clear out their stocks they're about to go into the 1869-70 issue. And the B-Grill was lying around. They just sent everything that they had. We know from, there's a fantastic letter that uh, Shepard wrote, wrote to um, Zeverly in, in December of 1868, in which he says, we're on the verge of going bankrupt. We can't carry on like this. If you don't make a decision, we will go bust before we even have a chance to compete for the 1869 contract. So I think, and there's a lot of evidence that there was an enormous amount of experimentation going on. And, and one of the things I love about American Philately is the post office, the post office masters seem to have been very pragmatic. As long as somebody, as long as it looked as if somebody actually spent three cents, they would, they would frank anything and send it through the post. Um, and so the big girl could arrive at this obscure post post office in Texas, it gets put onto stamps. One letter gets through with four of them. It eventually gets discovered in the 1930s. And that's the Beagle. That's kind of the story of the naming of the girls. Yeah. The, uh, the, the girls were used from 1868 to 1873. Mm -hmm. um, they never worked. I mean, I think it's, it's, it was a very expensive exercise for a problem that never really existed. Um, Peter Schwartz has put out a fantastic book on all of the different patents, um, including the tens of patents that were never even, never even resulted in essays. But he calculated that um, in order for the United States Post Office to have made back the money that it spent producing the grill stamps, two thirds of all used stamps would have had to be cleaned and reused. What I love about the United States philately especially is that it, it is really so full 
of this um, just out of the box thinking and experimentation. And there's just so much that we can still um, discover or learn about what people were doing back then. I would like to thank you, I think, on behalf of the society for an elegant talk. It's excellent research and it, it's explained so well in your talk. And we thank you very much. And we also thank you for being an editor in the Chronicle, editing the section on uh, proofs and essays. Thank you.